What I'm going to do is, is keep this really short and hopefully sweet, uh, talk a little bit about influences in, in my work. And I've been at this a little bit longer than Anthony and assembly. And um, <laughs> I'm, you know, after years of giving lectures and, and talking about the work, I'm frankly kind of sick and tired of talking about the work. So the way I like to do it is talk about the things that I think are important to how I make decisions and how I work with people making decisions. And hopefully that will also elicit something in the conversation, because I'm actually more interested in the conversation than I am in some of the stuff uh, that I might be showing you guys. It's actually, I think, important to note that none of the photographs except or the, this sort of introduction includes architecture in it. Because in fact, I think architecture is sort of almost a sub-subject to the way I like to think about architecture. It's not the <coughs> architecture with a capital A. It never has been. My dad was an architect. I actually, after growing up with a dad that was an architect and being around his friends, the last thing in the world I wanted to be was an architect. I <laughs> thought there was sort of an entitled, elitist, sort of arrogant sort of culture that I wasn't particularly interested in participating in. I was saying earlier that um, it was always interesting to me that when I would uh, hang out with, with the architects, um, somebody would say, oh, your dad built my house or built my project. And I said, well, not actually, really. There was a whole bunch of people that actually built it. He didn't have anything really to do with, uh, with building the architecture. And I think there's always been this sort of interesting bifurcation between the making of architecture and the designing of architecture. We're located in Seattle, Washington. That's the northwest corner of the uh, United States, just right below Canada, Vancouver. Uh, we're right by the stadiums. One thing I want to make really clear is that we are, <laughs> weirdly, 150 people. That's a total shock to all of us. When I started the firm, we were 12 people. That was in 1986. And we actually immediately, within like three or four days, went down to seven people. So it didn't look good. <laughs> um, but we are, um, but the way we sort of sustained our practice and expanded our practice, and this is probably really important about, for the discussion, is we don't hire architects that want to be designers or technical people or spec people or construction managers. We actually expect, in sort of an old school way, we expect people to do everything from design scribbles all the way through the uh, technical drawings into the, um, uh, into the construction administration. And that's really typical, that sort of curve on the, on the work that we do. Now what we don't do is we don't actually make, we don't actually fabricate, and we can certainly have a long discussion about that and the bifurcation between making and the design. But what we do want is everybody's personality to begin emerging in the project. Because in fact, the other personality that's really important in any project is the client or clients that you're working with and the craftspeople and the, uh, and the contractors that are actually building the project. Probably, really, if you're really doing your job, if we think you're really doing your job, the projects become what's somewhat idiosyncratic. They become somewhat sort of a reflection of the people that were involved in the project. Now, the way we make decisions may be actually a little bit different than the way Anthony was, was describing uh, the way Assemble makes decisions, but it's the same intent that really a building is a reflection of the people that were involved in the project. I hope that kind of makes sense. Um, it, and, and that's, I guess, one reason. I just want to emphasize that the reason I, I like talking about things that influence me as a personality are important and different from everybody in this room that, I, that is going to influence you as an architect or, or participant in any sort of making kind of place. And that's important to let that sort of, you just got to sort of nurture it, you got to recognize it, and then you got to sort of build on it so it, you become a personality in the, in the way uh, decisions are made. Uh, again, we're located in the northwest corner. That's where I live now. Um, lived there for a good 20 years. I lived in uh, Alaska for a bit. Uh, and um, uh, Switzerland just happened to be a, by luck, uh, basically, I guess. Uh, my parents were Swiss. I, I was a Swiss citizen, so I was able to work in Switzerland. But really where I grew up, that's the wet, wet side of the mountains. I grew up on the dry side of the mountains in um, sort of southern uh, British Columbia, Alberta, Canada. Uh, northern Idaho and eastern Washington, and it's really a, it's a landscape of, v of basically every ecozone you can imagine, from a, from a desert, totally dry uh, landscape to an alpine uh, landscape and everything in between. So I grew up with uh, mountains, dry mountains, uh, hot summers, cold winters, uh, forests, uh, and big skies. And what I think is important for me 
anyway, the, uh, for the way I make decisions and the way I sort of think about architecture, is because I grew up in this sort of big landscape, I actually don't know how important the architecture is relative to the landscape, if that makes sense. So because if you grow up in a big landscape, if you grow up in a big sky, you actually feel quite small, naturally, in a place like that. So you realize the context of the place is actually probably more important than some of the stuff that you might be doing or designing. It's sort of arrogant in a way if you think you're going to be designing something that's more beautiful than the, than the place you um, than the place you're working in. And I, what I mean by landscape is not just a rural landscape, which is, which is what I kind of grew up with, but also an urban landscape. I mean, London is, a, is an incredible, con uh, is an incredible la uh, landscape. Uh, any urban center is an incredible landscape and obviously has context um, that you should be, and let's see if this makes sense to you. In other words, the architecture kind of opens to that context and that context opens into the architecture and the architecture almost takes sort of a second um, nature to the place. Part of the problem with media, part of the problem with the photographs you're going to be looking when we have this sort of rolling uh, series of images is that the architecture is right dead center in the photograph. But uh, that's, that's just the nature of media. That's just the nature, that's the, that's the weakness of basically a photograph or a film or whatever. It's basically this two-dimensional object or two-dimensional thing, graphic thing in front of you. But we all know architecture is, is, a, is a volumetric, is a spherical experience. Um, and hopefully, if you visit some of the work we've been doing, you sort of sense that the architecture is not about itself, but it's about it, what's, what's happening around it. I was also lucky to grow up um, uh, in, a, in a culture of mountain climbing. Again, this is a, uh, the only point here is that, and I think this is important from an architectural standpoint, you are learning as students how to use your tools. And mountain climbing was, I was a knucklehead kid that thought to get to the top of a mountain was the most important thing, but I was lucky to grow up with John Ross Kelly and Chris Kopsinski, two of the best climbers in the world in the, in the late 60s. And what they instilled almost immediately in me was not about getting to the top, but it was how you got to the top and how elegantly and how efficiently. And that was really what you were learning to do, is learning how to use those tools, learning how to use your body, using, using engineering sort of problem solving as you go because it was not the hardware on your rack, it was how your rack worked with your body and your system to sort of either protect yourself or actually haul you up a mountain. And on, on any sort of levels, we could talk for hours on what they taught me. They taught me you have to be disciplined about learning your tools and once you learn your tools, then you can begin sort of uh, using them in, in ways of solving the issue in front of you rather than trying to just get to the top or seeing an end um, uh, in sight. Like Anthony talks about a little bit, uh, one of the quotes was about, you know, you sort of force your way to an end that you kind of imagine. Well, you, you shouldn't be doing that in the mountain. You should be, uh, ultimately, you want to maybe get to the top, but really that's not the point, is how you get to the top is the most important. So I hope this makes sense. I grew up in an, in an area of, because it was northern Idaho, eastern Washington, it was an extraction industry area. I personally, I didn't want to be an architect. As I said earlier, I wanted to be uh, uh, somehow involved in physics. Geophysics particularly interested me, and I think it had a lot to do with just looking <coughs> at the infrastructure that I grew up with. Um, these, this was before the grid, this was before uh, motors, a lot of this stuff. People had to use hydraulics, they had to use gravity, they had to use sort of the seven simple machines, they had to be sort of smart about how they engaged our physical, physical environment. Also grew up during a hot rod, um, and then um, Adrian sort of mentioned, the, I, I refer to some of the, the work as hot rodding. I think it's appropriate. I was, again, I was lucky to grow up in a neighborhood where virtually every garage had a hot rod under construction of some kind. And what I was able to, and now I look back on it and I recognize what I, what I appreciated about it, about that, that um, uh, era was that people were willing to engage a commodity, not a reinvention, uh, or a, a, a total new thing, but they would take a commodity and they sort of personalize that commodity. So they were able to sort of engage, could be a building, could be a car, whatever it is, you engage it, you repurpose it, you rethink it, and you make it in, in whatever is important to you, like the upper left-hand corridor is, you know, Big Daddy Ed Roth, you know, and that's the bandit. You know, it's kind of a horrible, build, a horrible car in many ways. And, uh, and yet, it's his personality, and he, you know, he has four wheels, he has a motor in the middle of it. That's all commodity stuff, but it's been rethought. It's like the tools in climbing, it's like the, 
um, the tools you use to build things. You're, you're, you're looking at your situation and you're reassembling it in your own personality. Actually, lower left-hand corner is pretty funny too. That's smiling Tommy Ivo. And you know, this is before computers and before sort of like real serious engineering. And Tommy Ivo um, thought that, well, if one engine would go fast, maybe four engines would go really fast. Forgetting that to simultaneously sort of control four engines was not only difficult, but the other thing that was problematic was that every time Tommy would try to drive this car, there was so much heat that was coming off the engine as he was driving, he'd fry his face as he was <laughs> trying to drive it. Uh, lower right-hand corner, uh, um, important. I go to the salt flats a lot. I just like seeing the sort of the intuitive building of some of these machines. Um, uh, these machines go very, very fast. It is all, it's also from an intuitive heart. These are not people that would call them, themselves artists. These are people that uh, maybe don't even call themselves craftspeople. They call themselves hot rodders. And yet I think some of the most beautiful shapes and inspirational shapes for me uh, come from some of the experiences I've had on, on the salt flats. Upper right corners, I, this is important. Um, again, because my, my parents are Swiss, we would go to Basel quite often. And there was a fountain there by Jean Tangley. And Jean Tangley was like high art in the 60s. And uh, this fountain, well, I didn't recognize this when I was a kid, but I loved watching this fountain because there's all these repurposed parts and pieces. And yet he made high art out of common things. And I think it was clear what he was saying here. And it, as it turns out, it was what he was saying is that there's real no difference, really no difference between high art and lowbrow art, whatever that is. And this, this is one of the machines um, on the salt flats in that beautiful landscape. None, again, none of these guys would consider themselves artists. None of them consider, they would maybe consider themselves craftspeople. Every part of this machine is crafted, considered, and wasn't intended to make a beautiful thing, yet it is a beautiful thing. It's a thing that goes very, very fast. It was done on an intuition. Um, and, a, and basically um, a, a collaboration between uh, a, a few people. Um, growing up around artists, uh, Ed and Nancy Keenholz in the lower left corner, Rudy Audio in the upper left, and then my mentor, uh, Harold Blaze. They all made their own art. They all felt that the only way you could really discover the art you were making, and this goes into the making or the drawing, uh, where that bifurcation happens in architecture is really somewhat problematic. They did not want that bifurcation because in fact they said as you were making, and Harold who I work on a lot of his sculptures just grinding them, he would say as you're making them, you're making it, you're making decisions at the nuanced, at the sort of nano level, at the micro level, and it actually adds more spirit, more personality to the, uh, to the project. So it's always been important to me to somehow engage, if at all possible, the makers of the work that you're actually drawing. In fact, sometimes I'll say, what we do is like composers. We kind of like scribble on this sheet music, you know, sort of this, these directions. But ultimately, those directions, if you're not the musician, you're giving those directions to somebody else and they're actually uh, playing the music and interpreting the music, uh, frankly. So that really is very important. Finally, this is the one piece of architecture that I always include in my intro. It's the last slide. And this is a cabin I grew up um, around as a, as a kid. It's, it's not my dad's work. It's, it's a guy who worked for Royal McClure. No one knows who Royal McClure is, but I think in, in 300 square feet, uh, Royal McClure did more architecture than 99% of the architecture that's out there. And he was able to engage the, the, the landscape. He told the story about the landscape between the horizon line, the, the mixed stand of forest, the water line, the shelter, public, private, all of it is basically in this 300 square feet of uh, architecture. And it, it speaks a little bit to my career, which is, um, I've talked about this a couple of times today, a little bit more about the modest scale projects, the granular scale projects, which in many ways I think are more important than the large scale projects. It allows you as, as students or young practitioners to do a lot of work and a lot of experimenting and a lot of R&D. It allows you to also go to different landscapes, different cultures, learn about different situations. So you're sort of practicing, like learning how to use your tools. But it also has, I think, in a granular sort of way, more effect in our, in our built environment over the years of building stuff. So with that, um, we'll, we'll get together on the, on the uh, table here and have a question and answer kind of situation. And they're gonna run a loop Somebody's going to start a loop up here of just stuff that I've been doing over the years. So 
you can, uh, and this is somewhat chronological just based on the work I've been doing for the last 25 years, I think, is basically what the loop's all about. Thanks. Thank you.